so uh, so far we have seen that you can generate all kinds of limits using limits of only certain shapes yeah those certain shapes which are very important are arbitrary small products and equalizers and if you uh, want to obtain all finite limits finite limit as in the shape of the diagram is finite then you can do all finite products and equalizers yeah? and there is another way of doing the same thing like if you have the terminal object and pullbacks then also you have got all finite limits now tell me something uh, about real numbers if real numbers have got all limits i mean rational numbers don't have limits of its sequences correct but real numbers do have limits of convergent sequences cauchy sequences let's uh, let me be precise what do we call it because of this property complete, complete. so we are going to use the same terminology over here uh, so let's start writing from this point so say say that a category c is complete if it has all small limits okay i yeah all small limits and finitely complete yeah that's another term finitely complete or an alternative is cartesian yeah we call a category cartesian if it has all finite limits so these are some commonly used names and when do we say that a category is co complete well obviously you can guess if it has all small co limits and it will be also called co cartesian these are just some names so a category which has all small limits we call it complete if you have a uh, partial order yeah which has all small limits then what do you call it a partial order complete order no that's not the correct one so first of all if it is both cartesian and co cartesian then we will call it a lattice yeah it's a bounded lattice so let me just write this for you that if if a poset p less equal is by cartesian by cartesian means both cartesian and co cartesian then it is a bounded lattice okay so uh, what are the limits tell me limits are equalizers and products yeah so finite products are meets then equalizers in posets posets sort of as categories equalizers don't matter because there are no parallel arrows at all so therefore you don't need to worry about them so for cartesian you just need to have all meets finite meets binary meets and the terminal and the terminal as well yeah what is the terminal largest element is the terminal object correct and similarly the dual version that all joins should be present and the minimal element should be present that's why it's a bounded lattice whereas if it is by complete then it is called a bounded 
I mean it's automatically bounded because that's in the definition but it's a bounded complete lattice. Yeah, it's called a complete lattice. So automatically lattice property, I mean lattice property is equivalent to having good limits. And completeness also comes from completeness because arbitrary products are nothing but arbitrary meets in FEMAM. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, while we are talking about functions which are, sorry, while we are talking about categories which have certain properties, but we don't really stop there. We always have to talk about the maps which preserve all these things. When we are talking about posets, then normally the functors between posets are monotone maps. But functors which are which preserve limits are called meet semilattice homomorphisms. Functors which preserve co uh, finite co-limits are called join semilattice homomorphisms. And functors which preserve both are lattice homomorphisms. So basically, uh, we have to talk about functors which behave nicely with respect to limits and co-limits. So there, there are three different ways in which limits and co-limits can interact with each other. And we are going to write about them. Now, uh, normally like, yeah, uh, see here, you have got uh, poset p and poset q. If you have a function from p to q, then it can preserve order. Yeah, if p1 is less equal p2, then f of p1 is less equal f of p2, preserve order. If f of p1 is less equal f of p2, then you can ask that p1 is less equal p2. What do we call it? Reflex order. Now, the, uh, there are similar such notions for limits. The third one is more interesting. Yeah, so let me talk about uh, that later. So, say that a functor f from c to d preserves limits. And I'm al always going to talk about <coughs> of shape J. If uh, for any diagram D from J to C, yeah and given and a limit cone so limit cone is l to let me call it theta sub j to dj where j is in objects of j just to brush up your memory what is l called in this cone what is the technical term for l summit and what are theta j is called legs okay and the limit cone this for d the cone what will be the preservation property if it comes from you it's always better what should be the preservation property that you take the image of this cone inside category d that still remains a Limit cone, a terminal object, correct. The cone FL to FDJ and this should be F theta J, J in objects of J is a limit cone for what? For which diagram? <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, limit cone is never for the shape, limit cone is always for a diagram. So which diagram? FD, correct. Okay, so preserves limits, simple thing. 
uh, we'll look at examples together yeah for all these three properties so say that a functor f from c to d reflects limits of shape j if for any diagram d from j to c and a cone l to dj theta j j in object j uh, for a d if its image if the cone fl f theta j f dj j in object j is a limit cone for fd then the original cone itself must be a limit cone for d then l theta j dj j in object j is a limit cone for d so you are given just a just any cone then you take it further along f and that becomes a limit cone then you ask that okay if that is a limit cone then my original my starting point must have been a limit cone itself there are obviously some definitions like this uh, for colimits preserves colimits yeah preserves uh, reflects colimits we are just going to do it for limits but you should practice writing down the definitions for <coughs> <coughs> for colimits okay now there is this last thing and i will tell you the name so say that a functor f from c to d creates limits of shape j if for any diagram d from j to c okay now here something is interesting so create as in we have no idea about anything happening in c something good happens in d which means the limit cone will exist in d but that limit cone the summit of that limit cone need not be in the image of capital f but what we ask that no there should be a lift yeah there should be a lift as in there should be a particular cone in the original category which maps to that well maps to that is a bit strong statement in category theory we shouldn't really do this yeah it maps to that like perfectly we don't know a priori whether that summit of the cone is in the image but what we require it should be isomorphic yeah that cone should be isomorphic to something in the image and moreover yeah the last property is important let me finish writing this part and then we'll see last property okay given diagram this and a limit cone m mu j f d j j in object j for f d directly we have data for fd yeah nothing for d uh there exists a cone l theta j dj 
j in object j such that uh, over uh, for d such that its image like fl to fdj f theta j j in object j is isomorphic to the limit cone the given limit cone and moreover any such cone is a limit cone for d this last condition is extremely crucial so what we are saying that anything any cone over d that maps isomorphically to the limit cone over fd then any such cone should be a limit cone yeah we are immediately going to look at some examples and then you will see what i am trying to say here so for example now well uh, whenever we start with examples always forgetful functors are the nicest examples so u from gr to sets okay does it preserve limits does it preserve products let's say what is the product of two groups cartesian product so cartesian product will it preserve product yeah good then uh, what more it preserves products it preserves equalizers how did we construct equalizers recall in the category of groups right so preserves limits and also creates limits see basically what we are saying that any limit that you want to construct in the category of groups you first construct it set theoretically and then it automatically gets an induced group structure from the diagram that is what the meaning of create is yeah, you don't have to do any extra work it actually lifts yeah i mean in this case you can actually have a strict lifting if you read maclean's book then uh it's written there that you need this uh, cone in the definition of creates limits yeah you need this cone l to dj l theta j to map directly to m f dj m mu j yeah we are not said, there it's not said that it should map isomorphically it requires you to map it up to equality but we are taking this uh weaker definition slightly more relaxed but in this case it actually creates limits however uh recall what is the coproduct of z and z two copies of z in the category of groups free product <coughs> now uh does that mean that this forgetful functor actually preserves coproducts free product is too large yeah compared to the underlying set so therefore it preserves this but does not preserve coproducts you can actually like write lot of things yeah the, like this you you have multiple 
you you take the uh, an example of a functor and then ask all these properties what particular limits does this functor preserve what pro proper what particular limits or co limits it reflects and creates yeah this is an open playground and i want you to play with such ideas yeah however it will preserve directed co limits yeah if you care about them enough if you work with category theory for long enough then the uh the most important co limits you will care about are directed co limits yeah uh, okay so what about let's do the same thing with top and sets so what happens will it preserve something it will preserve all limits okay so this functor u from top to sets it preserves limits and co limits okay uh by this i mean all small limits and co limits but it doesn't create products or any but it doesn't create or reflect them okay for example if you take x cross y with discrete topology where x and y are topological spaces then you know that with respect to uh, discrete topology any map with domain discrete is always continuous so therefore this is definitely a, a cone over two element discrete diagram x and y two object discrete diagram and uh, if you think about reflection then take u of this what will it map to it will map to a product diagram in the category of sets however yeah the this diagram is not a product what should be the product diagram in the category of topological spaces the topology on x cross y should be the product topology so therefore it doesn't reflect similarly it doesn't create them either because this is the last line which which i said is important yeah that any such cone which maps isomorphically to a limit cone must be a limit cone itself yeah this last line that there is a cone such that this is isomorphic to the given limit cone and any such cone is a limit cone so there are multiple such with product topology as well as with discrete topology both of them will map to the product uh, the limit cone so it can't create so you understand like what we are saying i mean we are saying something very profound about standard mathematical object but it's being written in a very uh, abstract language okay so uh, i'm not going to spend any time with any more time with these concepts yeah you should play around with with these concepts yeah take any functor and ask what you can do however now we we will go to something else and we still want to talk about limits and co limits but this is a very interesting property like even undergraduates can understand this suppose you are given yeah i mean i'm going to write down this problem uh, properly so suppose x is a set then what algebraic structure does the set of functions from x to r can be equipped with yeah 
you understand this question set of all functions from x to r x doesn't have any structure yeah x is plain set but real numbers have lot of algebraic structure it has got what algebra structure point wise addition point wise multiplication then point wise zero point wise one so basically because r plus zero is a group so functions from x to r that also becomes an a group it also becomes an abelian group it also becomes a ring it also becomes a vector space so x doesn't need to have any structure it just comes from the codomain okay so the same thing we can say about categories that if the codomain category has lot of structure then the functor category has lot of structure okay so that's our next theorem okay suppose d has limits of shape j we always do it locally yeah limits of shape j but you can do it globally also suppose d has limits all limits then you can continue then for any category c the functor category cd has limits of shape j and the evaluation functors f mapping to fa from cd to d for a in object of c preserve them okay you understand that if d has a lot of structure then cd also has the same structure and the evaluation maps preserve them we are actually going to use this property to construct these limits yeah that the evaluation i mean this is not a property we'll slowly build this up the proof is going to be technical but before we go to the proof let's discuss the ideas that are involved what should we start with we should always start with a you want to show it has limit of a certain shape a huh? cone directly cone you should first be given a a diagram okay a diagram in the functor category yeah we are again going to call it d so that's why i always separate this d with category d okay so a diagram is given then you want to construct a limit over that diagram it's not directly possible however if you compose it with the evaluation functor then you land inside category d which has limits of shape j so therefore you can construct limits there individually for every object you can construct limits so you will get for any object a you will get la as an object and now you have to use the data of las and their universal property to also construct image under image of l uh, image of morphisms under l because for each object a of category c we have got an object la of category d but we should also have for any morphism a to b in category c you should have a morphism from la to lb in category d and once you have all such data 
then collectively that will form a cone over original original category original diagram d and once you obtain a cone then you have to show it is a limit cone okay so it's a multi step process let's start with that so let d from j to cd be a diagram let da from j to cd to d be the composition functors composition functors yeah where what is this second functor it's evaluation at a yeah f maps to f sub a so what is da da is sorry f maps to fa not f sub a you know the first one first one is given to you the second one we have already discussed what it is okay uh, be the composition functors with limit cones la what should i write i will use lambda j a to d j a where j is an object of j okay so little j is an object of j that that should always be the index of legs d of j is a functor yeah d of j is a functor from c to d and we are evaluating it at a to get an object of d category d so that's how we are writing yeah and la is just the name of the summit right now it doesn't mean anything we have assigned it the name la yeah and i'm choosing a limit cone always <laughs> with limit cone this what is a here a is an object of a is always an object of c so for each object of c i have a limit cone over which diagram d sub a and what is d sub a it is the composition of original diagram d with the evaluation functor at a okay so uh, now what what should we do this is just the object to object assignment we started with some a and i got some la a was from c la is from d i got that but now i should do morphism to morphism okay so uh yeah yeah it's just an evaluation functor so yeah correct whatever is the natural choice how do we know that l is the limit no it's given that d has limits of shape j so i know existence of limits in category d yeah but how do we know that uh, i mean it is it is in the the range it is in the image of f it is in the image of f no it doesn't matter see what i did i uh, so we we started with a diagram in the functor category so what are the uh, objects in that diagram they are all functors i evaluated each functor at object a yeah. so i i mean that the these dj a's would dj a's are would be like objects in d objects in d correct and then we'll get a limit which is an object in d 
object in D and I'm calling that summit as LA. No, no, LA is the name given to the summit. So L is, but L is a morphism in CD, right? No, no, L is not a morphism in CD at all. Oh, L, L, L has no meaning so far. I have just said it's LA. Yeah, up to isomorphism, I can always do that. If you remember, then the proof for equivalence of categories that we did, we did something similar. Yeah, if F is part of an equivalence of categories. <coughs> Sorry, uh, the fully faithful essentially surjective functor. Yeah, we always construct it like this. Yeah, same thing. LA is just the name. I'm going to construct a functor L out of this data. Okay, so given F from A to B in C. Now, uh, I need to show something. So, uh, we are going to, okay, ultimately, yeah, uh, ultimately we are going to use this diagram. I will draw, keep that diagram aside, but we have to justify a lot of things before that. So, we have DJB, okay, then we have DJA. So, from DJA to DJB, do we have a map? What is it? DJF, correct. And from LA to DJA, I do have a map which is lambda J comma A. Yeah, that's what we are writing for this. And from LB to DJB also, I have a map. I call it lambda j comma b. Okay, if I can show that when while starting with this, this top one, a, I have a cone over the original diagram. So, what is the uh, base diagram here? It's db, d sub b. If over d sub b, I have a cone whose summit is la. Yeah, I do have some legs. I, I have to show that it forms a cone. If I can show that it forms a cone, then it will factor through the limit cone. And the limit cone has summit LB. And that map, that factorization is always unique through the limit cone. So, in that case, I will get a unique morphism from LA to LB and that is what I will denote by LF. You understand this? No. See, I have D sub B at the base. D sub B is a diagram in, in category D. Okay. D sub B is a diagram in category B. And I, I know a li the limit cone over that. What is the summit of that limit cone? LB. LB. And what, what are the legs of that cone? Lambda JB. Okay, if I can construct another cone, then the limit cone is terminal. So I will construct, I will show that there is another cone with summit LA. And then because there is another cone, there will exist a unique factorization through the summit of the limit cone, namely LB. And that unique factorization I will call as LF. So, that's, that's how I am constructing my functor L. Okay. So, uh, given F from A to, uh, A to B in C, now I need to show something. Uh, we will argue that whatever I have shown in the diagram, yeah, the, these compositions LA to DJA to DJB. Uh, this is DJF and this is lambda JA. J in object J is a cone 
over d sub b if we can show that so that there is a unique factorization of this cone through uh, the limit cone i.e. Lf from La to Lb. Okay. Now, I have to write a proof of this. Yeah, it's not yet complete. So, proof of this cone over db. It's a composition of uh, what is a natural transformation. Lambda sub j a is not a natural transformation yet. L A is the diagram. Uh -huh. So, a cone is a natural transformation from a diagram whose uh, image is a single object hmm. and all the morphisms are identical uh, to a, a diagram. That is a cone. Okay. So, the first part is a natural transformation. How is lambda j a an, uh, a natural transformation? Like in A, LA to DJ A. Huh. Hmm. So that is a natural transformation from the diagram which ends up at L and the diagram uh, DJ blank. Uh, sorry, D blank C. D blank A. Okay, we'll do it directly, then we will talk later. Uh, so how do we show that? Like for any morphism in the original diagram, so uh, in the original shape category, so given alpha from J1 to J2 in J, in morphisms of J, yeah, uh, what do we know? We need to show uh, this D alpha b d j1 f lambda j1 a equal to d j2 f lambda j2 a. This is what we need to show. What we have done, we took the first leg, then covered a morphism in the image that is same as directly covering the leg for that particular object. Is this clear? Yeah, look at this. These are the two different legs of that diagram. And this is the morphism. This curly morphism is the morphism that is covered in the diagram. So, we have to show this. So, what will be this left hand side? Well, for that we will need some diagram. Yeah, and I will uh, I'll use that D is a function DJ. Yeah, uh, okay. Let me draw that diagram as an aside over here. I can directly write this, but I try to make life simple for the audience. So, DJ1A and here I have DJ1B. Then 
what is the map from dj1 a to dj1 b you tell me dj1 dj1 f okay what will be the vertical one obviously i am changing j2 j1 to j2 and i am keeping a what are the vertical maps d alpha a and this is the same thing dj2 b and this is dj2 f and this is d alpha b okay so this diagram commutes and therefore what is this particular side well we have d alpha b composed with dj1 f which is one side of this commutative square i have to replace it with another side so i will write dj2 f composed with d alpha a then lambda j1 a and can you see why this is true because this underlying part d alpha a lambda j1 a this underlying part is lambda j2 a why is that the case as suresh already said why is that the case because something is a cone what is the cone the original limit diagram has that cone property no no see la la to dj a lambda j a that was a limit cone so in particular it was a cone so therefore i went from la to dj1 a and la to dj2 a and inside the diagram i am moving moving along d alpha a so that diagram commutes so that's why this second property is true okay so that's how this commutation we wanted the horizontal one but we went via this and that's the reason why it forms a cone over db once it forms a cone over db i already said that there will exist lf from la to lb okay any questions over there so we obtained a morphism which we called lf yeah again it's a name given to lf okay so now i'm just going to write something which you have to accept so uniqueness of lf ensures that l is a functor in cd and lambda j from l to dj is a natural transformation So Suresh were you talking about this particular natural transformation which we just proved Okay so uh, lambda j from l to dj is a natural transformation all these things are now straightforward yeah because now if you have la to lb and lb to lc then it should do exactly the thing that you want the composition should do the thing that you want so therefore composition is also preserved identities are preserved everything works because of uniqueness of this factorization yeah so very uh, beautiful way of obtaining a functo obtaining functoriality via factorizations furthermore uh, what are the components yeah we are saying lambda j from l to dj is a natural transformation what are the components of this diagram i mean components as in components of this natural transformation lambda j sub a yeah that's how we write the components alpha sub a yeah so right now uh, 
now what do we now we we start with part 2 of the proof yeah so uh, clearly l to dj lambda j j in j uh, is a cone over d Why is it true? Why is it a cone over D? You have to check this property, okay? I will give you what you want to check. If you have DJ1 and you have DJ2, then this is lambda J1, this is lambda J2 and whenever there is a morphism alpha, then this should be D alpha. Why does this diagram commute? Where is this diagram first of all? In which category am I drawing this diagram? This commutative diagram? CD category, correct. Functor category. All of these are natural transformations. Even though I am writing them as arrows, they are natural transformations. And this diagram does commute. Because of uniqueness, exactly. So therefore, this is a cone over D. Okay, now we have to show that given any cone, let me say f to dj uh, and theta j, where j is an object of g, over d. Okay, what do we have? So, this is a cone any arbitrary cone, we need to uh, obtain a factorization of any arbitrary cone through the original cone, the limit cone, because then only we can prove it's a limit cone. But we can't directly do it. We have to first go to the category D, yeah, by via evaluation functors or by simply taking the component. So, given any cone theta, f theta j over d, yeah, what do we get? Well, I am just going to draw another diagram over here. The eighth component of this particular natural transformation is from here to here. Yeah, that is theta j. Uh, Maybe I should draw it a bit vertically so that you can understand what is happening. So, this is Fa and this is my Dja. This is a morphism in the category D, theta Ja. Similarly, I have La and I have lambda Ja. And Fa to La, what do I have? There exists a unique factorization because it is a limit cone. Yeah, you, what, what do you need to show? There is still something to show. But because this is a cone over D, its composition with the evaluation functor is also a cone. And therefore, you can get a factorization through the limit cone over the composed diagram. So, there will therefore, there will exist a unique functor, let me call it theta sub a, such that this diagram commutes. Yeah, so, given any cone, we have this particular factorization and hence, a unique theta a from fa to la for a in objects of c. Now, this is the data that we needed. So, for each a, we have a morphism fa to la. What does that mean? If it satisfies certain commutative squares, then this becomes a 
natural transformation. So, such that, let me also write that lambda j a composed with theta a is equal to theta j a. So, therefore, I mean this is happening for all j in objects of j. Therefore, theta a, a in objects of C forms a natural transformation, forms the data of a natural transformation. Okay, so because this is the data of a natural transformation and we get this natural transformation by uniqueness of factorization. through limits and this is the, oh, uh, maybe I should write one more line. Since theta a are unique, yeah, okay, so this theta is the required factorization of f comma theta j through l comma lambda j. I guess some of you have already given up, you are just copying. <laughs> See the proof is not hard. The idea is very simple that you are given some cone, you only know one thing to do, you, you do that thing, but there is a lot of technical verification involved here, like where exactly is this diagram? Okay, so I'm going to give you one very simple application of this limit business and preservation, yeah, that you will enjoy, I'm sure. So, uh, f from a to b in any category, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I shouldn't use the notation, is a mono, if and only if, yeah, the pullback of f along itself is identity. So, a to b, a to b, f, f, and this is a, identity, identity, is a pullback diagram. Okay, so this is an important observation. Dually, what will you have? This is an AP if and only if identity comma identity will form the push out diagram. Okay, so therefore, if it has very interesting consequences, therefore, if F from C to D uh, preserves pullbacks. and C has pullbacks, yeah, I mean, I should have written this first, that C has pullbacks and F from C to D preserves pullbacks, then F also preserves monomorphisms. Okay. So, a criterion for testing whether monomorphisms are preserved. And there is another, like maybe I will call this one, a second one. Yeah, this one you have to do a little bit of work. Okay, so the second application of this fact is that if D has pullbacks, then alpha from f to g in the functor category is mono if and only if each of its components is mono. Okay. 
Okay, so natural isomorphisms, you have already seen the statement. It, it's always true. It's a natural isomorphism if and only if each component is an isomorphism. Now, this is a corresponding statement for monomorphisms. Right. Any questions so far? So, uh, the one interesting question is, can we find some common property of all the functors which preserve limits? All limits which are pre present in C, we want a common property for all such things. They should be preserved, yeah? And the answer lies in a very interesting new concept that we are going to study. But before even uttering the word, let me give you some examples. Yeah, so, uh, all of you have seen topological spaces. Uh, what is topology? What is an open set? Collection of uh, subsets of power sets, okay. So, and similarly, closed sets are also subsets of power sets, yeah. Like each closed set is a subset of the topological space. So, suppose x is a topological space. I am not going to write the x comma tau because this is not a topology class, but I will uh, write something. Px is its power set. Cx is the set of closed subsets uh, of x. And Ox is the set of open subsets of of x. Okay. Then I have something interesting happening here. Between Cx and Px, Cx definitely embeds inside Px. All closed subsets are subsets. And in the reverse direction, do I have a map from Px to Cx? Closure map, okay. So, this is inclusion and this is closure. Closure we usually write by bar. And what is the property that if A is contained inside a closed set, I am going to use letter F, yeah. The inclusion of F, this happens if and only if the closure of A is contained inside F. Yeah. So, for any A in Px and F in Cx. Do you agree with this? A set is a subset of a closed set if and only if its closure is also a subset of that same set. Dually, we have something for open sets also. Yeah, uh, we have open sets and the whole set of subsets. This is also inclusion. And from power set to OX, what map do we have? Interior map. Okay. Okay. So let me start with any A over here and any U over here. Then what can I say? It should be the dual property. So, I will say that U is contained inside set A if and only if U is contained in the interior of A. I will write just to highlight that the inclusion of U 
in the power set is contained inside A, well, I, U and U are not different, but they are just elements of different posets. Okay, so I, U is a subset of A if and only if U is contained inside A interior. Now, if I write the same thing down in home language, so home is non-empty on one side, if and only if home is non-empty on the other side. So, let me write that. So, in Px, yeah, Px uh, without brackets. So, Px iu comma a is non-empty if and only if in ox u comma a interior is non-empty. Now, either this home set can be empty or singleton. So, when I say, when I am saying that this is non-empty if and only if the other side is non-empty, I am actually saying there is a bijection between these two sides. Okay? Because one side is singleton if and only if the other side is singleton, then similarly one side is empty if and only if the other side is empty. So therefore, we have this bijection. Similarly, for closed sets and power set, also we will have a bijection. And what is happening, that there is a functor, i is a functor, yeah, i is inclusion map, it's a inclusion map of posets, it's a monotone map. And similarly, interior is a monotone map, both of them are monotone maps, so therefore they are functors. So, one functor i is changing the comma and it is becoming interior on the other side. It's just crossing the comma and it becomes a different functor. So, this phenomenon is called adjoint functors, adjoint pair of functors. I and interior, inclusion and interior are adjoints of each other. Inclusion is the left adjoint, interior is the right adjoint because inclusion appears on the left of the comma and uh, interior appears on the right of comma and we write it like this that i is a left adjoint of the interior functor. What can you say about this one? The closure and inclusion? It's the opposite way around. Yeah, that the closure functor is a left adjoint of the inclusion in this particular situation. Now, let me give you this definition of this concept and this is again one of the most important concepts in category theory. So, adjunctions, they, uh, they were introduced by Kahn in 1958. I am surprised why people didn't see them earlier because now people say that adjunctions are ubiquitous in mathematics ubiquitous omnipresent, they are present everywhere and uh, you will see how they are present everywhere, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> what we want, yeah, a pair of functors F, uh, sorry, uh, C, D, F is here, is said to be an adjoint pair of functors if for any A which is an object of C and B which is an object of D there is a natural bijection i am just going to call natural bijection phi ab from 
डी एफ ए बी टू सी ए जी बी सो यू कैन ऑब्जर्व दैट एफ क्रॉसेस द कॉमा ऑफ कोर्स यू लैंड इन अ डिफरेंट कैटेगरी बट देन इट बिकम्स जी ए एंड बी आर हैव द फिक्स लोकेशन and you always have to write categories appropriately there is a natural bijection naturality in both b a and b okay i can tell you what naturality is in two different ways once again yeah first one is simple like we are talking about home functors ultimately yeah so if C and D are locally small. Then naturality in A and B is an isomorphism. Is a natural isomorphism between. the following functors following parallel functors first one you start with it's always covariant in one component and contravariant in another so which uh, for home set which one is contravariant first one okay so i'm go going to start with c of cross d okay the first one is simple it's c op cross c and then i land inside sets and the second one is also simple i go inside d op cross d and then i land inside sets so tell me the name of the functor from c op cross c to sets this by functor it's the home in c that's the only thing you can do c blank blank this is d blank blank and over here c op is being preserved so you will say one sub c op and cross what will you do from d to c you will go via g from d to c you can go via g and from c op to d op what can you do f op and cross identity on d okay so this is a natural transformation between these two but what does really uh, what does naturality really mean naturality means that the choice of bijections is natural otherwise you will have to choose it individually for every pair of objects but they should be compatible with the category categorical structure that we already have so naturality in simple words yeah so let me do naturality in b you can do naturality in a similarly it will be contravariant yeah remember that so we have d f a b and c a g b okay this is phi ab naturality in b refers to if i am given a map from g b to b prime then i have fab prime and phi ab prime over here and cagb prime this is another bijection phi ab prime how is it related to phi ab well i have the only thing i can do if i have a map from fa to b i can compose it with g and on the other side i can compose it with gg so this diagram commutes that is naturality in b similarly you will have naturality in a it will be contravariant i mean ideally i should finish here but it's not fun if i don't give you any examples So I'll give you a couple of examples, and we'll continue next time with more examples. So examples in green. So obviously, from groups to sets, 
we have all looked at this you always need to look for example like pair of functors in opposite direction from groups to sets you always know what it is forgetful functor in the opposite direction do you know any functor free free group functor very good so let me call it f then are you convinced that free group functor is the left adjoint to the forgetful functor what do i mean so i start with a set x yeah and then i take the free group free group on x and g and this is happening inside the category of groups and on the other hand i am working inside sets from x to the underlying set of group g okay tell me the universal property of the free group it's free in the sense that the image from fx uh, like image is determined by the image on the generators x so any function from x to g is going to naturally extend to a group homomorphism from fx to g that's precisely this bijection is and that's a natural bijection in both x and g yeah you will have more such examples but perhaps i should stop here for today